the center for Latin American studies. I don't think that I need to introduce myself today. <laughs> um, today we have, um, no, it's not our last, but um, maybe our last of November of the class uh, speaker series talk with Lorena da Silva Tennis, who is our class postdoc in Afro um, Latin American studies, um, which um, I think it's important to say also for the students that we um, fit is part of a of a consortium on Afro Latin American studies, which is formed by um, two universities here in the U.S., Harvard and us and four um, universities in Latin America, in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia. and Colombia. Um, and uh, Lorena is our first postdoc. So we got a grant together last year, and it's the result of the grant. Lorena has uh, her PhD by the University in History, by the University of Sao Paulo. Um, she published two books, her master's, called Libertas Entre Sobrados, Mulheres Negras e Trabalho Doméstico em São Paulo. Um, free Woman, I don't know, Sobrados. Story, yeah. Stories too. The what? Stories. Yeah, yeah. true story. Mm -hmm. Black Women and Domestic Labor in São Paulo. And the other one, who is fairly new, it's called Lisa Benguela e Filipa Crioula Estavam Grávidas, Maternidade e Escravidão no Rio de Janeiro. You know, so Teresa Benguela and Felipe Pinola were pregnant, maternity and slavery in Rio from 1830 to 1888. And today she's going to talk about pregnancy, childbirth, and child care experiences of African women and their descendants in the Americas. All right, Lorena, thank you. Okay, thank you, Taylor. So good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank for your presence here um, and also to, to thank all the members of the class, Center for Latin American uh, Studies and the warm way that I was received here. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to share with you some findings and some topics of my um, postdoctoral research. So uh, pregnancy, childbirth, and childcare experiences of African-American women and their descendants in the Americas, 19th century. So to, to begin uh, our conversation here, I would like to uh, share with you some ideas, some topics that I developed during my PhD. Uh, and from these PhD, actually the, the questions that I am addressing now to another context, they are quite the same, right next to the ones that I uh, addressed in my PhD. So uh, I worked on the history of African women and their descendants in Rio de Janeiro, that in 19th century was the capital of the Brazil empire. I focused on gender, reproduction, and motherhood. And these topics have been, um, have been silenced by Brazilian historiography until the beginning of the 21st uh, century. And so I focused on pregnancy. Uh, I tried to um, understand the knowledge just a little time here. Sorry. So the knowledge and the practices regarding uh, pregnancy, menstruations, the abortions that African women and descendants uh, they did. I try to map uh, the urban work regimes and the impact of these different uh, skills and kind of works on women's health and well-being, and also uh, to the health of their babies. Yeah. And regarding childbirth, um, from the historical sources, I try to understand the differences um, regarding the background and the practices among white and black midwives, and also the practices of the doctors um, that were called by the enslavers. Um, they were uh, they studied in some medical school institutions. They uh, are were funded at the beginning of the 19th century in Salvador and. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, and uh, I studied some clinical cases where we could see some what we call nowadays an obstetric violence with these women, with these women, and also the practices of these uh, doctors in their uh, black women's bodies and with their babies. 
I will also address breastfeeding and weaning practices. So the impact uh, of work regimes uh, regarding the restrictions that enslavers uh, they put on uh, their practices and the forms of uh, resistance that these women perform. So uh, I could see in a lot of historical sources that these women could um, maintain the African pattern of two-year-old, um, two-year breastfeeding, but at the same time, depending on the kind of work they were, they had a lot of restrictions regarding their, breast, their, their breastfeeding practices. So, for example, the wet nurses. I, I try to deconstruct a myth that in Brazil is very uh, important. That is the mãe preta, the black mother of whites, and here the mammy myth. Uh, this myth was developed by photography and literature, uh, trying to uh, the enslavers try to. Um, uh, create an idea that uh, the domestic slavery was harmonious and benevolent. So uh, actually in the these women's reality, they couldn't care and breastfeed their own babies in these situations. And also uh, I address kinship, friendship, and the bonds that free and enslaved women created uh, among themselves in the um, city of Rio de Janeiro. We had a huge African population during the, mainly the first half of the 19th century. And also um, I address the work regimes and the restrictions that enslavers um, put in their lives and also the strategies that they uh, created to face these uh, restrictions. So for example, they tie, these women, they tie their babies into their bags, mainly uh, wash women, the laundresses and street sellers. Uh, and also how they face, these women, they face the high mortality among uh, black babies and uh, from uh, their babies until one year old. So these high mortalities, they, um, uh, they were produced, let's say, by the negligence of the enslavers. And I try to understand how these women they face these situations, uh, the funerals, and also the use of amulets to protect these babies. So in this photograph, we can see this is a, a Mina Tapa, an African uh, woman from the West Africa in 1865. This photo was done in Rio de Janeiro. And you can see like her, her, her baby and the use of amulets and also this hat that this baby was using, this would be important for us. So um, for, uh, further, I will make a comparison with another photograph. And so the sources, the historical sources I use in my PhD. So uh, I uh, researched uh, newspaper texts and advertisements, uh, about 80 medical theses that were produced in the um, Faculty of Medicine. Also paintings and photographs that were uh, done by white men, European and Brazilian. The writings of travelers and naturalists, they were in Central Africa during 19th century, trying to make a comparison among the practices of these African women here in the Americas and uh, in the Central Africa, actually Congo and Golem women. And I also use some medical, I gathered some medical manuals for coffee plantation owners. I didn't use these sources in my PhD because I um, I centered the study in the city of Rio de Janeiro. So they were not useful for my PhD. And now I'm using um, these sources in my postdoctoral research. So now uh, I, I am addressing similar questions regarding their uh, experiences and their practices. Uh, but to another context, so now we're going to talk about the coffee plantations in Southeast Brazil, Rio de Janeiro and uh, Paraíba Valley, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo uh, states uh, during the 19th So to introduce my project, I would like to um, propose to you an analysis of uh, a photograph. Um, I will we'll try to make with you an external analysis of these photographs and an internal analysis of these photographs. So this one is the, the uh, let's say, the original photograph. The photographer is a French-Brazilian man called Marc Ferris. The name I translated the, of the photograph, Departure for the Coffee Harvest in an ox cart in 1885, three years before the end of slavery, the abolition in Brazil. So uh, here is the... Um, is the uh, original photograph and this one I make like a, a zoom. So could anyone 
uh, answer this question for us. So about the role of the photographer. So he was a professional. Do you imagine that this meant he was a service of whom? Was serving whom? Why he was there taking this photograph? Who asked him to take this photograph? Documented property. Yeah, probably the enslaver. The enslaver. So do you think that this is a spontaneous photo or it was a pose? Like people that were still. What do you think? It's posed. Actually, if we study a little bit about the technology of photographs at the time, we know that if we move, it will blur the, the image. So people that had to be like still. Um, so if we, we go to an internal analysis, the postures and the, the gestures of these people, and also their material culture, the how they are wearing and their clothes, we can see that there are some, um, the clothing as markers of gender and class and status, just for an example, we have a man here with a, a hat and with uh, shoes. So probably it was the overseer. And we have the population here, the African-Americans, they are bare, bare feet, barefoot. Um, and also we see that they have their tools, work tools. And uh, we can see also women with uh, their skirts and also their babies. Um, and I would like to make a um, zoom here. We make it clear. So the social context, this picture was uh, shot in a decade of abolition. So it was a moment of lots of insurrections and quilombos in the Southeast of Brazil, the fugitive communities. And we can realize that the owner and the photographer, they are trying to build an image uh, of a pacified uh, order and the image of organization of an extreme, extremely violent system that was dismantling. So we are talking about the uh, decade of abolition, a lot of resistance and revolts that happened. And here at this image and another one that I will show you is a construct an unslavers construction of this. So let's take a look at a zoom in these women. So uh, I try to find some traces in these images uh, regarding the practices and the experiences of these women. So the, this image can give us some insights into their lives. So what about the, um, if you take a look at the objects and the clothing, we see that we have four women here, the types of work that they probably um, were responsible for was uh, the laundry, doing the, the, the were washing women of the clothes of their slavers and also their own communities. It was a gender um, task, let's say it was um, uh, women that they perform the washing of the clothes. And I would like you to take a look of some details about their babies. Is there, we see four women, they are young women, um, they have these baskets with some, some clothes and we have four babies that they are uh, in, their, in their arms. Is there any difference among them if you see something different in these babies regarding the clothes and the position that they are? Let's take a look at this one here. Yeah, please. Fully swallowed. He's fully, yeah, swallowed. So we see that he's a little bit maybe smaller than these, the other ones. The size of the baby, he's, he's, oh, he's covered all his body and his hands, uh, his head also is covered. If you see this woman, she has a, a belly, she's a little bit um, bigger than the other. So maybe it could be uh, a woman after uh, a postpartum moment. She gave birth recently. And this is interesting to, to take a look, to make a comparison of this baby and the one that we saw in the other photo. It was very common that African women and their descendants cover mainly the head of their small babies. And then when we go to uh, naturalists that were in Africa uh, and some studies um, of African um, societies, uh, Central African societies, we see that the head is a very important part of the body these people and with the head of witchcraft and bad spirits could or could damage uh, their health. So it was very common that the mothers cover their the heads of their small babies. And in this case, we see her her head also very close to her baby here. Yeah. 
So these images is just like uh, some questions we can use these images and also try to use other other ones to um, in the research. So now another image here um, that is from the the same photographer Mark Fehes departure departure for coffee harvest Paraiba Valley. So here is um uh, the community is bigger we can say the the community or the enslaved community. Uh, and we can see that they are in front of the slave quarters. We can know that because of the, um, the construction, the, um, the doors, and also we have some clothes that are being dried here. We have uh, about 32 men and 21 women and 15 enslaved children. So at this, this side, we can see uh, these men, they, they are upper in the, the chart. Uh, maybe we have like free male laborers and the enslaver, and here the community. Also, we have some gender differences regarding the, the clothing and uh, some tasks, some work um, tasks. And um, we have here a little dog. If I don't know if you can see it, so <laughs> relaxing. Everybody's gonna work, and the dog is just here <laughs> sleeping. And uh, so, um, and the work tools. So I would like we to take a look right now when we make a zoom in this part because our top here are these women and their children and their families. So the types of work, trying to, to figure out um, the practices, the, ch the child rearing practices and breastfeeding. So this woman, we can see that is a very um, interesting representation because she's looking at her baby in one, arm and she had here a uh, pen the instrument that she will, will use probably to the harvest and we have also here some older women and younger children so take a look at this woman do you see because the image is not so so good um, uh, the quality but she had white hair and she has a very serious face and we can imagine that this old woman was maybe the midwife that uh, helped all these uh, younger women to to have their babies, and also we see some details. For example, these um, older children they have their hands in the shoulder of the smaller ones. So we have it here and here. So we have some. Also, we can compare this finding or this detail with some other historical sources that say that the uh, older children took care of the smallest. So here in this image, we see these communities of many of them. They are linked by kin relationships. They are from brothers, sisters, and mothers, and and grandmothers also. So these communities they were linked with ancestry. Uh, and so, uh, some of the questions that I um, I'm, I'm going to address in my postdoctoral research, so that is focused on what experiences, worldviews, and knowledge were shared and developed concerning childbirth among African women and their descendants, enslaved and freed. Uh, if were there implications to enslaved women of the uprising of doctors' legitimacy among the slaveholding agrarian elite? Because I find out in many uh, clinical cases that the enslavers they call doctors to assist some difficult childbirth, and we try to understand these practices regarding um, the power relationship between these uh, African um, women, uh, descendant women, and white doctors. And also, I can see it. Um, What roles did older women play in childbirth and the upbringing of enslaved children? It's a very important question. Uh, and if were there similarities and differences regarding women's experiences and slaveholder practices related to reproduction and motherhood in Caribbean, mainly in Jamaica, uh, in the United States, the South, and in Brazil, the Southeast Brazil during 19th century. So to answer these questions, I will use a lot of secondary literature, a lot of uh, studies um, about these uh, uh, motherhood and reproduction in the Americas, and the historical sources I will use are post-mortem in, uh, post inventories uh, from slaveholders in these coffee plantations, because when the enslavers they, they they died, there were like a list of uh, their properties and uh, human beings. So we have their prices, 
also sometimes don't have the relationship that they had among them, like families, daughters, sons, mothers, and also the uh, work that they performed. I found two midwives, very few, but in these big, uh, uh, these large communities, these women were very important because we had a lot of young women that gave birth and were mothers. Also, um, I am using, I will um, study baptism records. So the baptism records of enslaved uh, children, we could see a lot of midwives being uh, godmothers of children. So I was trying to trace this um, relationship between inside the communities with these uh, midwives and their mothers. Also, the clinical cases, uh, we can uh, understand how these doctors and the, why the enslavers, they, they try to manage reproduction and the health of pregnant women in these uh, farms. And also the medical manuals uh, for plantation owners, they were very important, mainly after 1850, when uh, the, it happened the end of the African trade. So after this moment, the wounds of uh, unsaved women would be the source to reproduce, to reproduce slavery. So some theoretical and uh, methodological frameworks that I'm addressing here. So uh, I am drawing in gender, slavery, and African diaspora studies in the Atlantic world. So also uh, studies of social history of uh, slavery in Brazil. Uh, and a qualitative research, I'm focusing on case studies, and I'm using the secondary literature regarding demography. So a lot of uh, studies that are very so right now, I would like to um, to bring to you some uh, ideas. Some uh, I would like to highlight some key ideas of some important studies um, in the Antebellum South and plantations uh, regarding African American midwifery. So there are two books. Two one is an article, and another is a, a book of two authors. That is Charlotte Fett and Mary Jenkins Schwartz. And they are very uh, important. There are some key ideas for me um, to my research. And I'd like to share uh, with you some of these ideas. So uh, Mary Jenke Schwartz, so she showed the importance of midwives to enslaved women to the communities. They are the older, the older uh, African women and African descended women, but also to the enslavers. So um, we can understand also the context of the, the importance of these midwives are the high birth rates of um, enslaved women, mainly after the end of Atlantic slave trade. So after this moment, um, the enslavers started to, to, um, to put in work, let's say, uh, medical control over their uh, reproduction, reproductive lives, the enslaved women. So they made some accounts on their menstruations. Uh, they thought that they abort, they tried to, to avoid abortions. And also they, um, uh, how can I say, they wanted these women to be married and to have lots of babies. So uh, it was in this context also that the importance of the midwives uh, were, uh, so they were very important in this context. Also, uh, the African-American midwives, they challenged some racial and gender hierarchies. And why? Because these women, they had a free access to other slave quarters, to white families, to the, the houses of white families in different plantations, in a moment when there was a lot of restriction over the mobility of uh, black people in the South. So these women, they, they, they were like free in, in the different plantations. Also, these midwives, they uh, played a vital role in African descendant. Um, so these African descendant midwives, they played a vital role um, in the experiences of enslaved women during childbirth. Also, they constructed bonds of solidarity with these uh, women. And also they could create with these women some alternative meaning to the childbirth, confronting the objectification of their babies by the enslavers. And also situating the newborn uh, in the context of kinship and also spiritual protection. So midwife and the South Plantation. Uh, also these, uh, these studies, they were important also um, to show how 
these women transmitted and created this knowledge during the birth birthing practices. So the use of herbs, uh, this knowledge was transmitted orally. Uh, regarding the assistance during childbirth, uh, so usually uh, there were family members and friends, female uh, friends and family members that assisted women, uh, enslaved women during childbirth. So not uh, not necessary. It was a midwife that had to be present there, but midwives they had specialized skills. Uh, they could be uh, these studies uh, show that they could be identified. The good midwives could be identified through supernatural signs like delivering twins or babies were born when babies were born inside the amniotic sac. So it was like supernatural sign that that, that woman had uh, special uh, skills to be a midwife. But uh, these women, these midwives, they were uh, very important beyond uh, birthing process. So they negotiate with enslavers resources to uh, uh, like food and clothing to these women uh, and the postpartum rest after they, they gave birth. And also these older African uh, descendant women, they were also very important in these communities as spiritual leaders. So now uh, I want to share with you two um, texts, short texts uh, to make an analysis with you. Um, so uh, regarding uh, midwives on coffee farms in Brazil, in Southeast Brazil, the 19th century. So these two texts that we shall discuss with you, they were written by a French woman, a white French woman, and a white Brazilian man, a doctor. So I try to uh, stress here for you how to make a, a, a critical analysis. So try to find uh, the differences between the descriptions and the interpretations. But of course, the descriptions, they are not so objective. They are interpretations in that. But try to, to use, we say, and in Brazil, we have um, a popular saying that says, we should not throw the water with the baby. It means like they are pro very problematic sources because they are written by people that were in the power, or white people. But from these sources, we can find some traces of their uh, perspective, women's, uh, black women's perspectives. So Adele Toussaint Samson, uh, um, she was a, uh, a woman from Paris. The name of the, the book is A Parisian in Brazil. So that was a book that she wrote after she came back to France about her um, memories about this time that she spent in the Brazilian plantations. And there was uh, a part when she, um, I was talking about the childbirth of an enslaved. So I made a translation here. I hope you can understand. So when a black woman is about to give birth, she's taken to the cabin where she is cared for by an elderly woman who performs the role of midwife on every farm. I witnessed the birth of those unfortunate women several times. One should not believe that Despite their rough upbringing, they have any more courage in those moments than we, white women, not at all. They call upon Mother Mary for help all the time and constantly cry out, oh, I'm dying, oh, Jesus, help me. So I stress some words here to try to, to make these analysis. So let's try to be historians here. What, what do you think that we could um, use these historical sources to uh, try to find out some traces of the experiences of enslaved women and also the power relationships among white people and black people, enslaved people in these situations. Any idea? So what information we could, we could have here, for example, when she says that um, when a black woman is about to give birth, she says she's taken to the cabin where she's cared for by an elderly woman who performs the role of midwife on every farm. So she's stating that in every farm we have older women and these women, they perform the task of um, uh, midwife. So a question that I made when I read this is, uh, women, enslaved women, they gave birth only in their cabins or there are other places 
So we, I had other historical sources that show that they gave birth, for example, in some Japanese infirmaria, some some uh, nurseries. nurseries, some nurseries that were okay. constructed by the enslavers and with the medical assumptions of what, of what mm -hmm. would be a childbirth. But in this case, she said that it's very common, like she says, uh, all every farm the older women, so it was common. But when she said that she witnessed the birth of those unfortunate women several times, what do you think about the what she's saying? What could we? Is that some, something important for us to to understand how was childbirth to these women? Silence. Oh my God. <laughs> so uh, she says she uh, was she invited to be there. Like she she said that she watched this childbirth several times. She's a white woman. She's French. They these uh, black women they were uh, African and African descendants. We are here in 1850, 1850. So we have a lot of African women there. So maybe we could, uh, how could these um, unslaved women feel the presence of this French woman there? So maybe they could feel as an intrusion. Maybe she just entered there and uh, it's like, it shows a little bit of power relationship because she said that she was several times in this situation. So we see that the presence of white people during this childbirth uh, they could represent, and then I use some studies of um, midwives here in the Antebellum South, then says that uh, uh, Black women and uh, women of African descent, they felt with um, a lot of like fear um, of the presence of white people during their birth because they had rituals, they had beliefs regarding the newborn, and maybe this presence of a white person there could challenge this. So just something for us to say. But here she said there is something interesting about an interpretation that she's doing. So the first interpretation is she thought that these Black women, as they were, they had a rough upbringing, they should not, they should have more courage during childhood. But she says, not at all. They feel pain. They, they call for Mother Mary and Jesus. So we see here also her assumptions and the interpretations regarding Black women's uh, responses to pain. Yes. So why was this woman there and how long was she in, in Brazil? And she was about one year. I think I'm not sure, but I, I remember I read the book. It's not, not a long time. And she was visiting. She was with her husband. I remember if it was like a di diplomat, di di diplomatic function. Mm -hmm. Would I say that? Di diplomat, yeah. And he was there. She was there uh, accompanying him, you know. And then she wrote some um, this book that actually the, there was an interest with the Europeans reading this this kind of literature. No, but she was there. Okay, so uh, another another text. So this one was published, uh, was written, uh, this text by Antonio Ferreira Pinto. He was a doctor, and he wrote. Um, a book that was addressed to the enslavers that was called, I translated, The Child Doctor or Counselor for Pregnant Women and Childhood Hygiene. It was published in 1859. That's a moment where um, uh, enslavers, they are, they are uh, beginning to struggle with the end of the uh, African trade. So there are a lot of, uh, um, a lot of books and texts that have been published by doctors trying to change the practices of the enslavers regarding um, women and babies, enslaved women and babies uh, to reproduct as slavery. So there is a part of this uh, text that I'll read to you. Many plantation owners com compromise the health of their enslaved women and their future offspring, even subjecting them to field work and other tasks, with some giving birth during labor or on the way, carrying heavy loads on their heads. So here we see that women, when they, they went into labor, not necessarily they were in their cabin with an elderly woman, a uh, midwife. So what, what, what information could we 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 have from the source. What do you think? 
So I, I have a question actually. In which situation this women could go to a cabin? Because here he's talking about that uh, they uh, give birth to labor. Mm -hmm. So that's for me a question. In which situation they could go to a cabin and to have um, a midwife mm -hmm. um, help with them? That's an interesting, very interesting question, Samuel. There is an information that unfortunately the doctor doesn't tell us is this plantation, how many women and how many men they were there? Because maybe we are talking about a harvest moment season, let's say. So in this moment, it was required the work of a lot of people. If then we can just make like an imagination, so fantasize a little bit uh, among these in these historical contexts. If there, there were a very a big farm, a big plantation, you know, a, a big community, like two hundred people, young people to work, maybe these women could go to a cabin and and, and give birth. So I think it depends on the uh, the size of the. Um, the farm, the plantation, and also the, the policies, the, the practice of the, the translators also. There are some works, some uh, in the Federal Writers Project, the slave narratives uh, here in the United States. There are some uh, former slaves that uh, witnessed women giving birth in, uh, in the middle of the cotton plantations in the, how can I say, in the, um, in the path to the cabin, to the cabin. So we see here a, a side or um, uh, a facet of oppression that targets women. So imagine that they are giving birth a moment that they are very vulnerable and feel a lot of pain and they can't stop working, you know? So this is something important to, to why to think about gender and these women experiences. So I'll make now some final considerations and so on some conclusions. So my research, uh, I, I try to uh, to trace and to uh, understand uh, some important aspects of the lives of Af African American women and their descendants in the Americas. And uh, the critical analysis of these historical sources that I was sharing with you, they can give valuable insights in the ways and the strategies of resistance that um, and the protagonism of African women and their descendants under slave resistance in the Americas, trying also to make a comparison between uh, these different uh, settings and the context of slavery. And childbirth, that is uh, the issue that I am researching right now, is fundamental to the understanding of the lives and the culture of African and African descended women in the slave societies in the Americas. And also, um, as we saw in this last um, in this last historical source, we can see that this kind of uh, some kinds of oppression that targeted specifically women, and also uh, researching midwives. Uh, it's important to highlight this uh, prestigious social role of elderly elderly women as midwives. They were very important also in the realms of healing and childbirth with an Atlantic perspective. So thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone. We should uh, open for questions. I see Manuel. And you can, uh, Lorena, you can take the questions. Or, or well, one by one, I Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we have one. Yeah, I was wondering, so you mentioned the medical manuals for slave or for enslavers. Mm -hmm. um, what were these documents like? Are these printed materials? Are they custom made for each plantation? Are they you know, regional, what are these mm -hmm. manuals like? They were actually, there are two very important manuals in the, the many of the, um, how they were, um, they were published, they are editions, printed editions, and they were bought by the enslavers. So I found, I found them in some uh, archives in Brazil. They are digitized, digitized, mm -hmm. and they were like books. They were just published in some key moments, very important ones. There are another one that is written by a French doctor, um, Jean-Baptiste Humbert, in the 1930s. That when started, when in Brazil we had a law 
to, to end the uh, transatlantic slave trade. But actually, we say that this law was to English people see, you know, the, the transatlantic, the illegal trade just kept on until 1850. So in these moments uh, where uh, the, um, uh, the coming of young people from Africa, it will be, it will end. So these doctors started to, to try to make some, uh, they made advices and how to, to take care of the health of the young slave people and women and babies and children were like very important um, issues because of the, the, the reproductive slavery over the babies. Because after the, the, uh, the end of the Atlantic slave trade, the continuity of the regime will depend on the wounds of these women. So they were like published uh, works and they just bought it in some levels. And, and so what, what's the, in terms of the content, um, what sort of advice is there as a, med is it a valid medical manual or is it wrapped with all sorts of other issues that are not instrumental to management of human beings? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually these, the, at least these both that I studied, because they are, they are some manuals that were, were written by ones and leaders. And some ones that uh, the ones that I'm working with, they were written by medical by doctors, so they were addressing some very practical questions. For example, regarding uh, childbirth and pregnancy, what these doctors they are saying to the enslavers is it, a very interesting um, uh, historical source because he's saying you uh, enslavers don't make your pregnant your nine uh, month pregnant woman work until like the, the source that we said. So what does it mean that non slavers did that? You know, so they are trying to change some very um, violent practices, oppressive working practices with uh, um, enslaved people to keep them, them healthy, you know, and regard to keep them healthy and saying uh, to, the, to have time to rest, what should they eat? Um, and regarding women, how long should they rest after giving birth? You know, so, so they are just giving some advices and trying to change some uh, practices of these enslavers, the, the slave holders on these uh, big plantations. So we can see from these um, manuals and these advices what, they what the enslavers used to practice. And we should go to other sources to see if these manuals were, if these advices were, what can I say, uh, if they if the enslavers followed these advices or not. So there are some travelers' writings at the end of the uh, in the eighteen eighties that they said that there are some uh, women with small babies. They they are put to in a, in a room like seamstresses, so they could breastfeed their babies. So there, but we we cannot. It's very we have to to, to see in different contexts you now because it changed regarding. The size of the, the plantation, if it was a plantation, uh, if it was a um, to exportation, you say that the coffee, for example, we have big uh, properties, or if it was like a small plot, you know. So all of these are important to see these differences. But usually we don't. This is something that we, we don't have yet in Brazil. Some in some deep researchers trying to understand if the the this practice, if, if as labor changed their practices. Okay, the nicer. Yeah, who are those Felix? So, so um, I'm Felix from uh, Africana Studies. Um, I um, was, I was in Martinique recently looking at some archives on public health, um, and um, looked at public health situations on plantations, um, and oftentimes they have fewer. Have, you know, it sounds like there are similarities in Brazil to the hat. Um, as on the plantation that was designed kind of like a hospital. Uh, and that, you know, where you know the women gave birth to and were cared, quote unquote, cared for in certain people. Um, people didn't like to go you know, from the archive suggests that they did not like going. Right? That's something that they stayed away from. Um, and another thing that we see is that um, the, 
uh, practices, public health practices uh, by, by the enslaved Africans continue after, you know, abolition. Um, and in fact, they, they, they may continue for, for decades. However, there, there is a time where you see certain change, immediate change in certain public health practices. Uh, so in the case of Martinique, for example, uh, it is with uh, departmentalization. When they become French in, 19, in 1940s, because now you have uh, resources. Um, so that makes me think of, about Brazil too, in the sense that, you know, I can see certain public health practices giving birth, et cetera, uh, health, you know, health care, you know, continuing, you know, well after abolition, right? And so the kind of question that I have for you is that when does that change? When do you see a, a, a change? Because I can imagine 1900, the same thing happening in 1880 is happening the same way women were giving birth, they're going to give birth in, in 1900 in the same way. So how do you, when do you start to see um, a change, right? Uh, and as a historian, what does, like, can you consult, like, evidence, like, newspaper, et cetera, et cetera, from, like, 1910, 1920, to make sense of also what was happening in the past? So it's kind of two questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you for your questions. Um, so you said that, that there are some records that um, show that these uh, people, African descendant people, they didn't like to go to these um, nurseries or uh, public these uh, health, uh, medical health systems. There is a work of um, about childbirth in um, Jamaica that she said that for uh, for example, giving birth in these in these uh, nurseries or in these rooms, for example, the rooms, the, the hygiene, the hygiene ideas of uh, West medicine uh, meant a lot of light inside the place and a lot of air, you know, like windows opened and it confronted some very important views, African views regarding childbirth. So they like it. And then some doctors, they, they say, just, just like to give birth in very closed uh, um, and dark rooms. So um, they, there are some sources, medical sources that we don't have in, in Brazil, I think like the, uh, in the amount, in the quantity that they have in Jamaica and in the US, talking about the resistance uh, of these people to be there. And I, I remember a recent work also about Jamaica and that said that these rooms, these places uh, uh, in the farms, in the plantations, they, are, they were considered um, a torture place. So people, they went there to be cared, to be healed, and but it also could be felt uh, to, to be tortured there inside, you know. So that's really interesting how the, the worldviews regarding health and good practices. So heal, they are very different among um, uh, white medicine. And here we'll make a, um, a link with your other question about the, these changes. So it's really interesting to, um, to, to, to see how during all the 19th century, the doctors, they tried to, to, um, to produce an image of popular healing, Indians, descendants, and uh, African descendants, as, um, um, how can I say, we have a word for that in Brazil, it's charlatan. Mm -hmm. It's like a person that does, uh, that is not a doctor, but he just pretends, and he's like a, a lying imposter. imposter. Yeah. And to say there is a myth of the ignorant and superstitious midwife, black midwives, and also popular midwives. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how even after abolition, and then we can see it by um, uh, trying to, to see how the public health, we, we didn't have after abolition, the hospitals. We, we had a tradition in Brazil of the Santa Casas de Misericordia, they were like hospitals, they were created by the uh, Catholic Church. Uh, but the medicalization of childbirth and pregnancy, it took a long, long time. So I can, I, we just have to go so, so far. My uh, grandmother, she gave birth in her house. She, she lived in a plot, a small plot 
in the, the countryside of uh, Sao Paulo. Nowadays in Brazil, we have many places that are very far from the cities and from hospitals. So when you think about these, um, how it changed the, the public health, we have to think also about the how Brazilian state um, ha have policies, public policies, and have a lot of problems regarding the mm -hmm. public health in, in Brazil. So, but there's also something interesting that I would like to, to address here about obstetric violence. There are some studies nowadays that we can link the experiences of black women in the US and also in a lot of places in Brazil, in big cities. So uh, in the 19th century, we could see, uh, we, can, we could consider um, uh, uh, obstetric violence regarding the practices that white doctors uh, uh, did with uh, uh, black women. So very intrusive practices, measuring their pelvis and using instruments and in very violent ways. Nowadays, some studies shows that the obstetric violence, sometimes the negligence, because the view of the medicine nowadays is giving, um, is giving, how can I say, um, anesthesia and care, and these women sometimes they are, they don't have pre, pre, prenatal, you say pre-birth meetings with the doctors. They have less time. They are not touch their bodies. So the white doctors and they doesn't touch their bodies. They had a lot of problems looking for a maternity in the time of giving birth. So usually, what what should be what is common to white women middle classes and even poor women or white women they have they know where they should go when they go to 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 into labor. And so the, what, what they say, peregrinação, uh, to make, they go like, to different hospitals to try to find a place. So a lot of different ways that these, uh, the public health um, confront and, and is violent, the kind of violence with uh, um, black women during slavery and after and the abolition. I just wanted to ask, so these medical manuals for the plantations, um, were they created out of, because the doctors wanted to make the experience of the enslaved women um, better out of some sort of like benevolence? Or was it more because it was related to the time where the trade, slave trade was uh, ending? And so they wanted, it was more like you know, how to take care of your car. Like you want to last mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, but very interesting questions. Thank you. So actually, the, I think um, that there is a kind of uh, some coincidence of what we we're, were talking about. So there is something very important that these doctors, they, they are trying to find a job because they are in a, in a universe that people just search popular heroes. So they're trying to, to make themselves legitimate and try to find the elites, uh, some, uh, how can I say, uh, people that were calling from them. From them. Okay, so there is this side of these, these practices. Uh, but the, in these uh, manuals, the medical manuals, there is um, a mixture of two different disorders kind of narratives when we talk about slavery in this, uh, this the decades of the, the last century, 19th century. So there is a very practical and rational interest in prolonging say this, the lives of enslaved people, of bringing children because they had a mortality among the small babies and it was very high. So there are some very practical advices like Women take like six months nursing them, winning, when to win the babies. But at the same time, in Brazil, we had an influence of the French medicine uh, that coupled with a kind of a, a benevolence discourse regarding slavery. So there was a, some, um, uh, these, these doctors, some of them, they just say slavery is just horrible. These people are just suffering. But as we cannot, finish the system right now. Let's make, they say, in a way, they, there is a discourse of well-being, these people being like happier, having a, a better life, but at the same time, at the very same time, and with the major purpose, was to, to fulfill the interests of the, 
this leave holding on some Yes. Did that answer? Yeah, so it seems like they, they coexisted. Yeah, they coexisted. The disc, we had the narrative. Sometimes it's, it's like the like, humanitarian, let's say, discovery, discourse, and but the, the, the view, the, the target that they have is just prolonging slavery and trying to to, to make the ass laborers change their practices. I have a question. Um, how do you think in the Americas thing? Because you were talking about your research primarily is about Brazil. Now mm -hmm. you're doing US a little bit. But then Felix came up with the example of Martinique. And I mean, is America what 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 is that? Is that there is something in common with African experience here in the Americas? Is a comparative like mm -hmm. place to place? How how are you thinking about it? Okay, so okay, um, there is an important issue about these uh, studies that uh, we can find a lot of um, regional. So when I talk about Americas, I am mainly uh, talking about studies in the U.S. plantations that we learned about South, that we have the most the volume of studies. Jamaica and Barbados, there are lots of studies regarding childbirth and, and motherhood. And in Brazil, we, we, we have some different studies. But I am trying to, to pick an approach, you know, trying to understand how, how the different backgrounds of African women. For example, we have the Central Africans in Southeast Brazil during the 19th century. We had an important uh, uh, background of West Africans in Jamaica, and also from in some settings. Um, so I, I'm trying to, to make a comparison in a, in a way that try to understand their lives and there are some commonalities and some differences. So regarding, for example, the communities, trying to understand how uh, in these uh, big farm, these big from Brazilian plantations in the Southeast, how they build uh, through the bad adaptive records and also the inventories, these communities among uh, um, with women regarding um, child rearing. And, and I'm really an open. I've, I've been finding some interesting works in Peru, for example, in Lima, in Cuba. So I'm trying to, I, I am, um, how can I say, I am still um, uh, trying to find out a better approach, you know, to and really different, different works. But trying to find common, commonalities and the context, the, the different contexts also. You can help me with that, <laughs> my supervisor. <laughs> Somewhere. Yeah. So um, the why you talking about, for example, about this photo that tried to protect the job. Uh, that there was no conflict, everything was fine. Um, if you just really look back back to 1820s, there are some uh, texts that were published. Particularly talking like Jose Bonifacio, there's this famous passage where he talks about the immorality of slavery. And he, he says something like, okay, these slave the woman, they can inoculate their immoralities by uh, bread feasting um, or babies. So we should not, we should just mm -hmm. abolish slavery. There's something about that. And my impression was that there was a moment that, or Maybe I'm wrong here, but there was a moment in that where this practice uh, was um, really um, was not well was not something that was positive. But at the end, we could see that people tried to uh, project this something that was positive. So what happened here, and what for they tried to project this positive image of this practice, because just, I mean, we were like three years um, uh, to go to, to the abolition of slavery. At the time, if I understood correctly, it was, I mean, uh, it was clear for everybody that this slavery would end, although we have like the uh, the guy, I always forgot, Jose Amores Contere, that was like trying to do everything to maintain slavery, but it was clear for everybody that this slavery would end. And they were trying to project in this image. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what was the purpose here? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a question I have. Sama, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting and difficult question to, to answer. 
And I think that there is not just one answer, but there is something that I'm thinking, thinking about here because you, you were talking about the um, Bonifacio discourse uh, regarding um, black brown slave women and their milk. So when we talk about wet nurses, we had during all of the 19th century, a lot of narratives, medical narratives, and in the, the time of abolition, the enslavers narratives. So the medical, the, the doctor, they said, they try uh, in the first half of the, the century, the 19th century, they made a, a, a violent, violent discourse uh, saying that these African women, there was a, a belief that the, the milk would transmit moral and cultural uh, uh, and diseases from the, the milk. And they said that these, uh, that they tried, actually, actually is a discourse inside a motherly uh, discourse targeting white women. So it came from France, this idea that women, they had to fulfill some duties uh, as a mother. And these labocratic women in Brazil, white women, they didn't breastfeed, they didn't take care of their babies. So these, uh, these discourses from these doctors, they tried to, to vil um, vilify, say that, to, to make these women become like villain and very bad women these African women to try to, to force white women to breastfeed their babies. But it doesn't work. And during the whole 19th century, they hire black women as wet nurses and they use their own enslaved uh, black mothers as wet nurses. And the images also, wet nurse images was a very powerful uh, image that was used in the end of uh, slavery, the end of the century and after it. To, to make what I said at the beginning of my, my presentation, to create an image, a very affectionate and, uh, uh, image of slavery. So the image of a white, baby, cute white baby in the arms of the black mother, well-dressed. And so it was a kind of um, um, an image that was created to justify it, to say a little bit like slavery in Brazil was not that bad, you know. But I think that these images that we were seeing, this plantation photographs, I think that they are they are they are not talking. We're not talking about um, these intimacy and, and these this other narrative about slavery. You know, this uh, intimate and that women and children, black women and white children, they were the main protagonists. But here, I think it's like the system. You know, like the system is passing. You don't see people being punished. You don't see people in. You know, it's just people with their work tools, going to work and well-dressed with uh, everything very organized. So I think it's uh, uh, an ideal, you know, a representation of the system itself. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, we're gonna have, on it's December fourth, right? Yeah. It's right. A what? The fifth. Okay. The fifth. Fourth is a Monday. Fifth. I think so. Yes. Yes. A talk um, by uh, political science that will by a colleague of Shane Ruby, who is from Fernando de Monge, who's um, now at. Um, in Cambridge and will come to visit us. So we included this at the uh, 